Hello, welcome to the second video about advanced techniques in systematic quantitative literature reviews. And as mentioned in the first video, this is one of a series of four that we're putting together to complement the original series of videos outlining the method, giving you um, more detail, more insights, and some neat little additional strategies around how to do this method and how to get more out of your database and your search engines. So in the first one, we went through how to be systematic to identify the papers. And in this one, I'm going to go through the coding challenges. And as mentioned, always feel free to go use the website, search for systematic quantitative literature review at Griffith, and up will come the site with a whole lot of support material, um, papers using the method, papers about the method, the videos, example databases, etc., to help you out. And if you end up publishing a literature review, we're really keen for you to cite us. So here's the original paper. Please do feel free to do that. And in that paper, we outline, of course, those methods that you use, those 15 steps, five for systematically searching for the literature, five for coding, and five for writing the paper. And what I'm going to do now is talk in some more detail about some neat little additional strategies for doing those steps six to 10, where you're going to quantify the literature using coding criteria. And the first of those steps talks about structuring the database. And that's about working out the categories and the subcategories. So you've identified the literature that fat fitted your systematic criteria. You've evaluated and said, this is the literature. So now, what is the information you want to gain from that literature when you quantify it? And so you have to use categories and subcategories to allow you to quantify it. And that provides a structure of the review. And those categories and subcategories have to relate to the research questions. What did you want to find out about that literature? So who does the research, where, using what methods, what response variables, what subjects, what type of analysis was used, and what was found? What are your research questions? That helps shape your categories. As mentioned before, we tend to use Excel. has worked really well where each paper is a row and the categories and subcategories are columns. But please feel free to use other packages we're not limited to this, it's just that this is one package that people already know about a fair bit. Now, there are common coding challenges that come up. And what we've found is that one of the classic ones is people don't spend enough time working out the categories and the subcategories and testing them. And it's a really good idea to get this right. And generally the answer is use lots. It's always much easier to combine categories and subcategories, but if you have to subdivide them, you're usually going to have to go back and reread the whole literature to work out where it fits in, a, in the new subcategories. We find that it's also really beneficial if you can use lots of subcategories so you end up being able to just put a one or a blank for each of those categories for the paper. And that comes about because later it makes it much easier using pivot tables and advanced meth analyses if you've coded it that way. People tend to start out using words we recommend you get on to using categories where you can just put a one or a leave a blank if it's not doing that. And I'll show you some examples. Also, you have to be clear about the rules for the categories and the subcategories. And I'm going to talk about that in um, more detail <coughs> because, of course, one of the challenges is even like really simply categories like country can actually be quite a difficult with different, quite a lot of tension around some locations globally as to which country they belong to. It's often also really good to check that the coding by doing different people, particularly if you're doing this as a set of collaborations with a couple of people, and that is to get take a subsample of the, the papers, a random subsample, and get two people to code them and then test the coding reliability and how consistent that coding is. But if you're doing this in, as a PhD student, the other thing to do is to be very consistent across the coding yourself and very consistent in explaining those. We also really strongly suggest you record the details in the second page of your Excel sheet about what you did with hard to code examples. And that's so you can come back later and remind yourself how you dealt with them. So let's go through these and look at some examples for what can be in the database. So here's an sort of default um, examples of how a database could be laid out. So the first thing is you had questions about who did the research, when and where it was published. So of course you therefore need to have categories for that. So these are some of the basic ones we think that should be in nearly all review. 
that it's first of all a unique number that you assign each paper so you can resort your database and keep track of them. Then who are the authors, which would be text, year of publication, number, title, text, full citation details of the paper so that can be directly used, the journal that it's published in, the name of the journal, and then a link to the journal website so you can just click on that to get back to the original paper. Next, you're often going to want to put the journal disciplines and the number of those subcategories is going to depend a little bit on how many different journal disciplines that they are. But also remember that individual journals can actually fall into several discipline areas. Now you could put in some, and I'm going to come to that in a moment, some really neat tricks with that. But what else do you want to know? It could be what institutions they come from, the type of institution or the name of the institution. We've even had cases in which we wanted to know about the genders of the authors, the country where they were affiliated, things like that. Think about if there's additional information you want to record because you'll need categories for that. Now for the journal disciplines, instead of you having to work out where the journal disciplines are, there's some really neat generally accepted um, criteria for the journal disciplines. So for example, on Scopus and the Vias Chicago site, you can download a list, an Excel file that actually tells you the disciplines for particular journals, then you can just search that Excel file for the title of your journals and then you can code across and you can see here's some journals that are in the social sciences, arts and humanities is the top one, the next one is in the physical sciences, so you can use that to really quickly record and consistently do it um, to code that information into your Excel file. Then very often we're interested in where the research was done. Now, in some cases, for some disciplines, that's irrelevant. So if you're looking at nanoparticle technology or something like that, the geographical location of the research laboratory isn't as relevant. But for a huge number of other projects in health, in psychology, in law, in environment, etc., con geographical context matters. So therefore, you're going to want to record details about the location of the study. And this could be at the broadest level of continents, and here we've got the standard definitions of the continents, but we've also included a general one, studies that may be more broadly based, not specifically to one or more continents. Then we've got countries, and as I say, here the number of those going across depends on the number of countries that your studies cover. One of the things you can do is start off with coding with category, subcategories for some of the more common countries, and then you can have a, ca a category at the end called other country and you put a one in there if it's not one of the, category, the other subcategories and then a text column after that where you put the details of the country. Now if after a halfway through your database you find there was a whole lot of studies from say China and you hadn't put it as a particular um, column, you could add a column then and transfer them across. So this is a neat way of dealing with that issue. But it may be that there are other information that you want to generate. You might want to record was the city or the climatic zone, bioregions, political system, political alignment, education system. What are some geographical criteria that are really important that relate to the context of that research? Now, what methods are used? Again, you want to have lots of subcategories around that. So start to think about at the beginning, what could the methods be? So observations, surveys, interviews, focus group, field research, case studies, document analysis, meta-analysis, spatial analysis, census analysis, modelling, other details of other. If it was experiments, did it do experiments, included controls, included statistics, ex what type of statistics were included, etc. Was it quantitative and qu only, qualitative only, or was it mixed methods? What are the other types of methods that are used in your area? Think about those put the categories in. And remember, by doing it with these subcategories, you get some differences. Excuse me. So that's the other point about it. By doing this, you can be recording where somebody, a particular study, may use case studies and document analysis, or may use several different types of statistics, etc. And this allows you to record that. Now, generally, we've tended to have weight the studies as equivalent. That is, we've used a vote counting method where we haven't sub-weighted them, but it's perfectly possible to do so. So you can include columns there where you weight the studies. And all you have to do there is you have to have some really clear, well-recognised criteria around that. So, for example, in some areas, uh, randomised control trials would be considered to be 
a higher quality of study than before after control impact or experiments with controls but they weren't randomised control. Observational studies or uh, are not at quite as high quality as the randomised control studies going down. And in some cases there are actually published checklists that you can use to compare studies using similar methods. So if they're using the same method, was a high, moderate or low quality study using that method. Now, if they're there and you want to use them, please do feel free and then you can incorporate that into the analysis. But it is a problem where you have interdisciplinary studies and how you have to access different types of evidence. Focus groups and surveys can both provide really important information about a study, so you don't necessarily want to have to code one as they being more or worse than the other. Then you want to be putting in categories about the subjects and the response variables. And this gets to vary enormously amongst topics. So it's really hard for me to say, here's the examples for all the different topics people can do. But remember on the website, we've got that long and expanding list of papers done in different disciplines. So one of the things you can do is go and look at papers that are close to your topic in similar disciplines and see how they did it and what sort of information they included. But also read some of the papers and think about what would be the relevant subjects and responses. And in addition to that, what are the results? And again, that varies amongst the topics. So we talk about some uh, when we were doing street trees where lots of the studies um, discussed something, but they didn't test it and they didn't necessarily find it. So one of the things for some of those we've put in was that particular aspect discussed, tested and, and or found. Also, in some cases, you might want to say, were the results positive, negative, neutral, mixed or other? And again, that might be something you code. Other important details were the statistical significance, the size effect, the number of replicates, the power of the analysis. What are the categories and subcategories for this? As I mentioned, this varies a lot among studies. If you're going to be using different types of documents in your um, literature review, then of course it's going to be really important to include categories around that. So is it peer-reviewed papers? Is it a thesis, book chapters, books, grey literature, etc.? So you have to include for the type of document. And it may be difficult to use same coding because in amongst these sorts of literature you may get differences. So in, the, in this case, if you're using these different types of literature, you may have some categories that only apply to some parts of the literature. So you might have some coding that applies to the papers, but other coding that may only apply to the grey literature. So have a think about that too. And it's good if you do that sort of thing and use the diversity of literature to also then in the statistics and analysis of your data, compare the results amongst different types of documents. Once you've worked out those categories and subcategories and had a sort of couple of discussions about it, thinking about it, then the trick is to enter 10% of your papers. And this is really important as a way of testing those categories. So you think they're really clear, you think you've got enough, but when you enter 10% or so of the papers, you start to find some, you know, the reality that sets in. How well did the categories work? Were there enough subcategories? Were there reasonably coherent rules around using them? So are they too narrow or broad? Do you need additional values, new subcategories? Do the criteria apply and work in reality? Remember the thing about countries, that can be really challenging. And as I say, reflection now saves a lot of time later. It's much better to think this through now and early on. Then you enter the rest of the papers and again cross-check your categories and criteria. Check all of those unusual ones where you weren't totally sure at the time. Go and look at that second Excel page. Have a go and think about, have I really got this now nice and clear and have, are these ones always going to be ambi ambiguous? How am I going to deal with it? Check your database is comprehensive from the reference lists because now you're saying this is the literature, this is the quantification of that literature at this time. And then step 10 is really important, is to pro produce and review summary tables. And this is really important not only for now being able to analyse the data, but also before you get too far doing that, check it's correct. There's that famous thing if you might have put a one in the wrong column, etc. So if you have coded using ones, for example, you can now use pivot tables in Excel to be able to work out the numbers for the categories and subcategories. Definitely remember to double check your data, those coding errors. So next video, hopefully this is soon going to be you, we're going to go through some of the more advanced ways you can analyse those data, particularly if you have been able to use numerical coding with ones and blanks. So check that one out.
Thank you.